So you're probably asking, what's this Nibbles and Bytes channel all about? Well, ultimately, it's about retrocomputing. But it's not like the usual mainstream videos, looking for nostalgia in video games or exploring the history of these machines. When I was little, I remember mostly playing games on trusty machines like my Commodore 64, but I also remember a deep longing to make my own games and my own software. Now that I'm an embedded software engineer, it felt like these simple machines should be easy to get back into, and I picked up a Commodore 128D in an attempt to do so. While I've been studying the machine, I've also been watching YouTube channels about retrocomputing. What I noticed was a significant gap in some of the content. Everyone seems to focus on restoring and maintaining these old machines, fixing the enclosures and the electronics, but most stop short of showing what you can do with them by writing your own code. So I've decided to give it a shot. I'm going to try porting one of my simulated retro games to my Commodore, and I'd like to document the process as I go. That way, others might continue the spirit of not just using these old machines, but also giving them a new spark of life through new software. The game I wrote was actually written entirely in JavaScript and designed to run entirely in players' web browsers. It feels clunky and gritty and definitely retro-styled, but I think I can do better with real hardware. Essentially, the game was the inverse of some of the old Unix roguelike games like NetHack. In those, you're the hero trying to delve deep into the dungeon to retrieve an artifact. In my game, you're a condemned prisoner trying to escape. The game is designed to use simple graphics, such as two color sprites and 16 by 16 tiles. While the Commodore only has 8x8 tiles, with the added RAM of the 128 and the better graphics of the VIC, this should be relatively easy. This is my Commodore 128D. There are many like it, but this one is mine. It has a reset button and two switches for the Servant and Jiffy DOS. On the right side are a few standard ports, such as the tape drive port, keyboard port, joystick port 1 and 2, floppy drive reset, and system reset. On the back are the usual suspects such as the expansion port, serial or drive port, 40 column video port, I think this one is a channel select for the RF port next to it, RF output, RGBI video out primarily used for 80 columns, and finally the user port which allows us to do all kinds of expansions. Let's power it up and see what we can see. This is an emulated screen since I don't have a capture card, but it should work for the moment. But before we dive too deep, I should show you a few key presses that might help you get out of sticky situations. The first one is Run Stop Restore. It's a quick way to soft reset the machine. The next is Shift Commodore, which changes the character set. Next up are the combined arrow keys in the lower right hand corner. If you press the vertical key, it'll move the cursor downward on the screen. And if you press the horizontal key, you'll see the cursor goes right. So now that we've covered all the ports and some of the keystrokes we'll need to use the 128, we should get into the nitty gritty. What makes this machine tick? Well, the heart of the machine is the 8502 CPU, which is designed to be instruction compatible with the 6510 CPU, originally used in the Commodore 64. But what makes it different from its elder brother, the 6510? The only difference was that the 8502 was designed to run at 2 MHz, rather than the 6510's 1. Unfortunately, this speed comes with a price. Since the VIC and the 8502 share the same memory bus, with the 8502 running at 2 MHz, the VIC can't access the RAM chips fast enough to render a screen. 
The end result of all of this is that programming for the 8502 is exactly the same as writing programs for the 8510. And this is great, since the 8510 is well documented and we'll be spending most of our time with it. So that being said, let's take a look at the 8502 architecture. So here's a quick diagram of the architecture of our CPU. The main inputs and outputs are actually fairly simple. There's eight data lines and 16 address lines. Of course, this means that the program counter, or the offset into RAM where we're running our program, needs to be divided into two 8-bit registers, as you can see here. Now the data lines are actually shared between three main 8-bit registers, the A, X, and Y registers. We also have an 8-bit stack register, which only gives us enough space to store 256 items on the stack. Next, we have the Arithmetic Logic Unit, or ALU. This gives us things like add, subtract, multiply, divide, and additional logic operations. Notice that it's connected directly to the accumulator and also the data bus. This allows it to fetch operands from X, Y, and S, but also store its results in A. The second to last piece of the puzzle is the instruction decoder. This actually uses the data bus and also the address bus to be able to fetch instructions from RAM. Now the last register is the status register, and this one indicates things like carry, zero, decimal mode, and overflow, so we'll want to use this occasionally with other opcodes. Note that the status register is also 8 bits, whereas the PC is 16. Okay, so that's enough of the theory. Let's actually get into practice. Let's see what the Commodore 128's built-in machine language monitor can do. The very first thing is we have to type in monitor. That'll actually get us access to the machine language monitor here. The first thing the monitor does is it shows us the status of the CPU. This is actually a list of all of our registers, specifically the program counter, the status register, the A register, the X register, the Y register, and our stack pointer. The first thing we'll want to do is disassemble range 1800 hex. This is part of the Commodore's application program area, or specifically where we can store our machine language code. Note that it's filled with nothing but break instructions. This is normal. When the Commodore restarts, it zeroes out this RAM. Let's start assembling an example that clears the screen by filling it with at symbols. A little explanation is in order here. This is the memory address column. It refers to the memory address that each one of these lines represents. These are the opcodes assembled at this address. Note that they can only go up to three bytes each. These are the assembler mnemonics used to create the opcodes to the left. And finally, these are the assembler operands. These are the values you use with an opcode to actually do the work. Now the program we just assembled deserves some explanation. This first line stores the immediate value 0 in the A register. This next one also stores 0 in the X register. Now these next four lines store the value of A at each one of these addresses with respect to X. In other words, it takes the address listed here and then adds X to it to determine the offset into memory. Now this instruction increments X. If X rolls over to zero, it sets the zero flag. Now here's where our loop comes in. If we don't have the zero flag set, then we jump all the way back to 1804. Otherwise, we just continue on to the next instruction. And finally, we have the return to subroutine instruction, which basically just jumps back to from wherever we were called. So let's give our assembled routine a shot. Let's use the jump instruction to start it. Boom! We have at signs. Now, we're still inside the machine language monitor, so we can still issue commands. Remember that RTS instruction? It jumped right back into the monitor. So now we can actually disassemble the program. Okay, so that's about it for this episode. Um, for the next episode, we'll be focusing on how the VIC handles sprites and tiles, 
how the character sets work in 40 column mode, and also how multicolor mode works. And I'll uh, catch you later. Thanks, guys.